thank you for uh, the introduction and also thanks to the organizing organizers of this uh, conference to give me uh, the chance uh, to talk here in honor of uh, our birthday boys um, <laughs> so i want to talk about this topic uh, namely uh, the model theoretic properties of maximal hardy fields um, and uh, well there are lots of very heavy talks uh, in this meeting so i'll start not by reading a letter from uh, Kobe, but um, ah, I need to do this. Sorry. Can I do this? Ah, there we go. But by reading a, a passage from a, a paper by uh, Giancarlo Rota called uh, Combinatorics Representation Theory and Invariant Theory, the story of a menage a trois. And um, in, this, uh, in this paper, you know, he's always very provo provocative. Uh, he contrasts um, two kinds of algebra, which he calls algebra one and algebra two. So he says that, so algebra one is the algebra whose bottom lines are algebraic geometry or algebraic number theory. Um, so the, uh, the people who started this algebra were in Dedekind and Noether and so on. Um, Algebra one has by far a better pedigree than algebra two and has reached high degree of sophistication and breadth. And algebra two <clears throat> has had a more accidented history. It can be traced back, as he says, to George Boole, who was the initiator of three well-known branches of algebra two, which are Boolean algebra, <laughs> Um, and in the second place, he says, the operational calculus that views the derivative as an operator D, part which we've heard in Anand's talk as well, on which Boole wrote two books of great beauty. So the emphasis here are mine. Um, and finally, of course, invariant theory. <clears throat> and he says, G. H. Hardy sadly condemned algebra two in England in the latter half of the 19th century with the exclamation, too much F of D. <laughs> and he says, G. H. Hardy must be turning in his grave now. <laughs> I don't know what's so subtle about this condemnation. Uh, <laughs> um, I actually tried to find out whether Hardy ever said this, but I, I, asked, I asked people who should know, but I was just not able to track it down. Now, I want to explain in this talk how you can actually combine algebra one and algebra two in their incarnations of valuation theory in, in algebra one or field theory and algebra two in, in the sense of differential algebra and model theory, maybe as an outgrowth of uh, Boolean algebra, um, how they can be combined um, to study objects of an analytic nature, which uh, they are Hardy's name. <clears throat> and somewhat amusingly, <laughs> um, this method that Boole introduced, or Boole first systematically studied, namely the, uh, the way of solving linear differential equations by factorization of the associated differential operators. Uh, you know, one, this is explained in the, one of these uh, two books, um, and which was so subtly condemned by Hardy, plays an important role in this whole endeavor. So I think this is kind of interesting. <clears throat> um, and well, in the, in the whole business, we are mainly interested in arbitrary algebraic differential equations over, over Hardy fields. But as a byproduct of this whole story, um, we also get a comprehensive theory of what one could call tame linear differential equations, uh, which gives a reinterpretation of some classical results. And I want to talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, and I think this is, you know, there's, there's much more to be mined here, but uh, we only scratched the surface so far. Um, yeah, and all of this is uh, joint work by uh, Lauf Andres, Joris van der Hoeven and myself. And uh, I know that some of you have heard talks about this before, but I guess not by me, but <laughs> by other people. So, um, 
let me, uh, before I get started in hardy fields, let me mention what, what the sort of the gold standard is. Um, this is the, the theorem that we teach our, that we torture our undergraduate students with, namely uh, the fundamental theorem about homogeneous linear differential equations with constant coefficients. Right, so I wrote down one example here. Um, we know that the solutions on the real line taking complex values, they form a C linear vector space of dimension, the order of the, of the equation. And um, you can write down a, a fundamental system in an explicit way. Yeah, so if you look at the distinct zeros of the associated characteristic polynomial, which is an ordinary polynomial, call them lambda one up to lambda n, and write down their multiplicities, d1 up to dn, then you get a basis of this solution space by these exponential terms um, and you know, multiply the powers of, of x running from zero up to uh, dj minus one. <clears throat> um, so you have a very explicit description of a fundamental system. Um, to do this. Um, in fact, uh, it, there are classical extensions of this theorem, uh, namely when the coefficients are not constants, but are rational functions. Yeah? So then there's a, a similar explicit description of a fundamental system. Uh, and this is all this theory of Fuchs in differential equations, goes back to Frobenius, et cetera, um, also at the end of the 19th century. Uh, but there you need more complicated terms. You can't really do with powers of x. You also need exponential terms and, and logarithms, but they can be explicitly described. I'm not doing this here, but um, they're very, very explicit. <clears throat> okay, so Hardy fields. Um, so I'm running fairly quickly through this because I think uh, a lot of people have seen this in some way or the other before uh, in this audience. Um, okay, so first we need uh, the ring of terms <clears throat> of differentiable functions. So for every R, I define C to the R to be the ring of terms, the plus infinity of R times continuously differentiable functions defined on a half line towards plus infinity, taking values in the reals. Um, and terms, right, so two, two, of such func two such functions have the same term at plus infinity if they agree on from some point on. <clears throat> um, and uh, addition and uh, multiplication are, are defined uh, pointwise in the natural way. Okay, and um, well, these C to the R, they form a decreasing chain of rings and I take the intersection and uh, this is then not just a ring, but it's in fact a differential ring. And uh, I denote this by C to, C to the less than infinity. Um, so, so an element in, in this ring, right? I mean, uh, for every R, it has a representative such that uh, that representative is C to, C to the R, but there's no single point from which the representative is required to be C infinity. If you impose that requirement and you get a differential subring, which we call C to the infinity, or you can also requ require there to be an analytic or eventually analytic representative. So then this is, gives us C to the omega. <clears throat> okay, so we get these uh, differential subrings. Okay, and then the definition of uh, a Hardy field is that it's a differential subfield of C to the less than infinity. And the emphasis here is on field. It's not just a sub ring, but it's in fact a field in, in the usual sense and differential meaning that it's still kind of the derivative. Um, and then in an analogous way, you can define C infinity Hardy fields rather than C, C omega Hardy fields as differential subfields of C to infinity and C omega. Okay, and then here are some easy examples. I'll give some more in a second. Um, but uh, for example, Q, or also the field of reals is a, is a hardy field because you can identify every real constant with the germ of the constant function with that value. Uh, but uh, you can also join um, X, the germ of the identity function. So then you get the rational function field over the reals. And here are some more complicated ones where you can also join E to the X or the germ of E to the X or the germ of log X. So in each of these cases, it's fairly easy to show by hand that they <laughs> form a hardy field. Um, but in general, uh, to construct Hardy fields is not such an easy task. Um, but uh, yeah, so these Hardy fields, they, uh, the functions in Hardy fields are extremely regularly growing. Yeah, so um, 
because they're continuous functions. Well, maybe I have this up here actually. Yeah. If you have a if you have a function in or a term, sorry, in a in a Hardy field, I'm I'm switching back and forth between functions and terms. So if you have an f in a, in a Hardy field and it's not zero, right? Um, well, then this means as a term it's not zero. So this means that not eventually equal to zero. Well, it could oscillate, right? A priori, but it has to have an inverse in the Hardy field too, a multiplicative inverse, yeah? because it's supposed to be a field. So this means that it cannot actually oscillate eventually. It has to settle down and be either eventually positive or eventually negative. <clears throat> so consequently, you can put a, an ordering on every Hardy field by declaring the function to be positive if every or some term is eventually positive. And uh, this turns H into an ordered field in the sense of algebra. Okay. And then you can apply the same kind of reasoning, uh, not just to F, but also to its derivative. You know, so if you look at F, F prime, well, if it's not zero eventually, it is either eventually positive or eventually negative. Um, and this means that F itself is eventually monotonic and it has to have a limit, which could be, well, in the extended real life. <clears throat> Could be plus or minus infinity. Okay, um, so these are Hardy fields. So yeah, so there, in the 19th century there was a notion of functions of regular growth, which was never really made precise, but one can make the point that somehow uh, you know the notion of a function whose term lives in the Hardy field is somehow the right the right uh, way of, of uh, making this making sense of this. <clears throat> Okay. Um, every Hardy field also comes what, equipped with something which we call a dominance relation, which is written with this uh, funny list and symbol. Um, but since I'll need this later in a more general setting, um, let me introduce it in general. Uh, this makes sense for any ordered differential field, for example, a Hardy field. So with, with capital C, I denote the constant field. And uh, if H is a Hardy field, then of course the constant field is always a, a subfield of, of the reals. <clears throat> and then uh, for F and G in, in H, I define F to be dominated by G if there's a positive constant, little c, such that in absolute value, F is less than or equal to C times uh, G. <clears throat> um, so another way to, the notice in, in the classical setting is by the capital O notation. Um, and then there's an associated relation with this, which is the strict dominance. F is strictly dominated by G if this inequality holds not just for some positive C, but for all positive C. Uh, but this can be uh, described in the Hardy field context uh, equivalently in terms of the weak dominance relation. Um, and this will be the little O. In, in the Landa notation. Okay. Um, okay, and then of course, uh, um, from such a relation, you can define a subring, namely uh, all those things which are dominated by one, which agrees with the, with the convex hull of the constant field in H, and this is a valuation ring. So we get an associated valuation from H, and uh, its maximal ideal is all those things which are strictly dominated by one. So one can think of those as infinitesimal elements. Um, and we, in order to remind us of uh, capital O and little o, we use these uh, big O, big script O and little script O. Uh, I'm not sure whether this will catch on as notations. But, um, yeah, and then here's a picture, of course, people here in this audience, uh, they probably don't need this, but uh, this is how we think about uh, such a hardy field, right? so we have uh, the blue area, so that's the convex hull of the of the constant field, and uh, <coughs> then around uh, zero here we have this little monad here of of infinitesimals, and I zoomed in here uh, to highlight a few <coughs> smaller elements. And then outside of O, you have the things that are uh, that strictly dominate one, so they go off to plus or minus infinity. Uh, okay, you wouldn't know how long it took me to. Make this picture. <laughs> um, 
Okay, and yeah, and so here are some examples of functions that or you know, functions whose charms live in Hardy field, um, which are of mathematical interest, right? So just to give an idea that these things are actually interesting for not just for logicians. Um, so for example, the arrow function, which uh, plays a role in statistics, right? This is a, a function, as we can show, based on some results that I mentioned in a second, uh, lives in a Hardy field. Um, and the, well, the, the other two sets of examples are a little bit harder to show. Uh, for example, the so-called airy and b airy functions. So these are two particular linearly independent solutions to this second order differential equation. Um, they live in Hardy field. Now, of course, remember that we always look at behavior at plus infinity. If you go towards minus infinity, both of these guys are oscillating. Yeah, so, um, but if you go towards plus infinity, they stop being oscillating and nice behavior. And then the last example is the gamma, well, as gamma function, um, again, on the left half line, it's awful, but on the right half line, it's nicely behaved. Um, and this is interesting because it doesn't satisfy an algebraic differential equation in contrast to the other examples. But still, it lives in the Hardy field. Okay. Um, yeah, so more examples of Hardy fields. Um, Hardy, and this is why they're named Hardy fields, he constructed uh, what he called the field of logarithmic exponential functions. So this is uh, the field that you get by starting with the rational function field and then closing off under algebraic operations, um, by which I also mean real, you know, taking solutions of polynomial equations. Um, exponentiation, logarithm, if it makes sense, and composition, if it makes sense. And he showed that, uh, you know, if you keep doing this process, um, you build up a, a Hardy field. Um, so for example, the error function, as I mentioned before, is, is lives in that. Um, and then this audience, of course, knows that, or most people, I guess, here know that O minimal expansions of, of the other field of reals are a natural source of, of Hardy fields because for every such expansion, you have um, the field of terms of definable functions, one variable definable functions, and that's, that is a Hardy field. <clears throat> um, okay, now, you, know, um, you might ask well, if you have a Hardy field, what kind of differential equations can you solve in a, in a bigger Hardy field? And, well, um, for example, what, what Hardy does here, right, he solves certain kinds of differential equations start, starting from Rx in, in larger Hardy fields and keeps on doing this process. So why not, do, why not take this to the extreme and take a, hard, a Hardy field that's maximal under inclusion? So this is what we call a maximal Hardy field. Um, by Zorn's lemma, of course, you know, every Hardy field is contained in the maximal one. So somehow these maximal things should be interesting, right? I mean, uh, because um, anything that you can conceivably solve in, in some Hardy field extension is already there. So like, what when can one say about these things? Uh, well, and then of course, uh, this is sort of a tautology, but in order, in order to answer this question, you need to look at the extension theory of, of Hardy fields. So there are some easy um, or easy, I mean, classical results that are sort of summarized here. Um, so one thing you can do is, for example, you can take the real closure of a Hardy field and that will always again be a Hardy field. So if you start with H, then it has a unique algebraic Hardy field extension that is, that is real close. Um, this is a result that in some sense without the derivation was already shown by Hausdorff, um, but then it was later you know, done in the, in the Hardy field setting by by Robinson and, and various other people. Okay, so then the next step, I mean, this is our algebraic equations. So the next step is first order linear differential equations. So there's a general result that says that if you have any solution y of, the, of an equation y prime plus f y equals g, where f and g are in h, then you cannot join it. You cannot join the solution y to a Hardy field um, and you will get a Hardy field extension. <clears throat> And uh, well, this is a key step in, in this construction of Hardy's LE functions. Basically, that's what it does. Um, and then in this form, I think it was first written down by Um So as a consequence, right? So if you think about maximal Hardy fields, what this says is, well, the maximal Hardy field cannot be extended anymore. Um, so it has to be real closed. It also has to contain all the real constants yeah, because these are solutions of the equation by prime equals zero. Um, well, and, and then a special cases of this, you get that 
maximal Hardy fields have to be closed under integration exponentiation and, and logarithm as well, right? because there are also special cases of these first order equations. Um, okay, but the problem is, uh, if you go try to go beyond this, then imme immediately you run into trouble, right? Because um, if you have a non-zero solution of y double prime plus y equals zero, then you get sign, you know, some oscillating thing, so sign and cosine. Um, but um, what is interesting, so I mentioned this, I mentioned this here as, a, as an aside. Uh, if you put uh, something non-trivial on the right-hand side, and sometimes it can happen um, that, well, in fact, as we'll see, uh, it will always happen. But it was noted by Boschenitzan that, for example, if you put e to the x squared on the right-hand side and you look at the solutions of this, well, they form an f-n space um, parameterized by a fundamental system of uh, the homogeneous equation plus a particular solution by zero. And any one of the solutions in this, in this f-n space will generate a Hardy field. But no, no two of them can live in the same yeah, because then by taking a suitable difference, you get sine and cosine or some oscillating thing. Um, so as a consequence, you see that, well, you get as, as least as, as, as many as there are in this two-dimensional space, uh, different maximal Hardy fields. In fact, you have to continue many, but in fact, you can show that they're, at, you know, generalizing this, this example you, or modifying it, you can show that they're in fact two to the continuum matrices. So there are lots. Um, but there are some second order linear differential equations that do have hardy field solutions. So one equation that one can reduce to the constant coefficient cases, for example, the cauchy euler equation, which uh, also plays a role in physics, which I wrote down here, which uh, depends on two real parameters, A and B. And for certain values of these parameters, given by this inequality there, uh, it actually has hardy field solutions. And if the inequality is violated, then uh, none of the solutions live in the hardy field there. Postulated non-trivial. Um, so for second order linear differential equations, the picture is already uh, more complicated than in order one. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, our main theorem. And um, this main theorem clarifies what the maximal, what the elementary theory of the maximal Hardy field is. And so for this, I want to, there are some choices here to be made, and I'll say a word about that after the theorem, but um, so we want to view here Hardy fields as, as structures in a language where we have the field operations, um, but also the ordering and, and the dominance relation. Okay, and then uh, the theorem is that any two maximal Hardy fields are in fact elementarily uh, equivalent. Now, for this theorem, you don't really need um, the ordering and the dominance relation because they are definable in terms of uh, the derivation. But um, for some refinements that I'll talk about in a second, these things are important. Um, yeah, so let me introduce uh, as a short, shortened uh, term here, the, the notion of an H-closed field. So H-closed field is simply a model of the common theory of maximal, maximal Hardy fields. Um, so we have refinements of this uh, theorem, more precise results. So for example, the, the theory of H-closed fields in this particular language, um, is model complete. And for this uh, to hold, you need the dominance relation. But this already gives some interesting, has some interesting consequences. So for example, you can also define a notion of a C infinity maximal Hardy field, yeah, which is maximal in the category of C infinity Hardy fields. Well, so if you have such a guy, it will also be an H closed field. Now you can extend this person to, to a maximal Hardy field. Yeah? But then this inclusion is an elementary inclusion. So this is a consequence of the model completeness. And you can see this as some sort of, um, well, I don't know, um, what do you call this? Uh, it's not an Artian approximation theorem, but you know, you basically say that if any, any kind of, I mean, it also works with C omega, right? So uh, you, you have any kind of uh, statement that holds in some Hardy field extension, then it will actually hold in some analytic extension. Um, and what, uh, what even better, not in this language, but in a, in a la slightly larger language, we even have quantify elimination. Um, and this has another uh, non-trivial consequence for Hardy fields, namely that if you, so up there I said any two maximal Hardy fields are elementarily equivalent, but if they have a 
common Hardy subfield. In fact, it's true that they are elementarily equivalent over this, this Hardy subfield. Um, this is not, in, I mean, it takes a little bit of extra work, but it follows from, from our, our quantified elimination. I, I don't want to state the quantified elimination here, but um, just as nice consequence. Okay. Um, okay, so in some sense, one can view this as a sort of the ultimate extension theorem for Hardy fields. So to make this, uh, to give some uh, evidence for this, let me state some extension theorems that follow from, from this uh, theorem and, and its proof. <clears throat> so the first, the first, okay, the setting is we start with any Hardy field H and at the moment I don't want to assume it's, it's maximal. And I, I take a, a differential polynomial. So that's just an ordinary polynomial in Y, Y prime, Y double prime, et cetera. And when I substitute a little Y, I substitute little Y, little Y prime, little Y double prime for its variables. Um, and I assume it to make, you know, exclude some trivial cases, assume it's not constant. So then there's one uh, nice thing is, um, well, P itself might not have a solution um, in some Hardy field extension. As, we, as one can see from the second order linear examples. Um, but if you go to the, the complex world, so I here is square root of minus one, then you can always solve this differential equation uh, P of Y equals zero. So there will be some Y and some Z and some common Hardy field extension such that uh, P of Y plus C times I is equal to zero. Um, now, this is, of course, very reminiscent of what's happening in, with the reals versus the complexes, right? So there are some polynomials over the reals that don't have zeros in the reals, but every polynomial has a complex zero. Um, and then there's also this intermediate value property, um, which is hard, harder to prove than the first statement, but it says that if you have two terms f and g, and f is less than g, then and P of P takes a negative value at F and a positive value at G, then there is a zero in some Hardy field extension um, between, uh, between F and G. And again, this is very similar to the, beha the behavior of ordinary polynomials over the real. And then as a consequence, it's not uh, too hard to show if once you study uh, the, the behavior of these differential polynomials as you plug in larger and larger terms, um, if P has odd degree, uh, then it will have to take positive values as you go towards plus infinity from some point on and negative values if you go to negative infinity. Sorry? Yeah, odd degree, total degree. Total degree, yeah, just total degree. Um, so, so it will satisfy um, the assumptions of two for suitable F and G. And so then this means that it will have to have a zero. In some hard field extension. <clears throat> um, okay, now you, of course you, you you must have been wondering what the, what this theory of edge closed fields is, right? So I said, well, I, I say this is the an edge closed field is by fiat <laughs> something that is elementarily equivalent to a maximal Hardy field, but of course you want an explicit axiomatization, and we have such an such an axiomatization. So I'll explain it. Um, Roughly, um, I won't give all the details, but uh, the sort of most basic notion is that of an H field. So these are what the differential fields where, in contrast to the situation that Anand was talking about, uh, we do require that the derivation and the ordering and also the valuation um, interact in a very strong way. So there are two axioms. The first one says that if F strictly dominates one and is positive, then its derivative is bigger than zero. Now, if you think about this in, in terms of Hardy fields, what does this mean? Well, if F strictly dominates one, this means it goes either off, off to plus or minus infinity, but bigger than zero means, okay, it goes off to plus infinity. Well, and then the conclusion is that its derivative then has to be ultimately bigger than zero. The function has to be ultimately increasing. Um, so that's H1 and H2 says, that you can decompose the evaluation ring as the sum of the constant fields plus um, the maximal ideal. 
Um, what does this mean in, in the hardy field context? Well, if you have a hardy field and it contains the real, so that's sort of the maximal constant field that there can be yeah, uh, for a hardy field, then it will satisfy H2. And then what H2 really expresses is uh, that any term that is bounded, yeah, so this is, uh, means it's in O, has to have a limit, which is a real constant at plus infinity. So it expresses the, the existence of limits. Okay, now um, there are some other more, more, maybe a little bit deeper properties uh, that maximal Hardy fields have to have. Um, so the first one is this Liouville closeness, which basically just summarizes um, the statements of this first set of extension theorems that I had mentioned, namely that you're real closed and any first order linear differential equation y prime plus f y equals g can be solved. So this is near real close there. Um, and then there's uh, this, uh, this property of small derivation, which is maybe a little bit technical, but um, necessary, namely that if f goes to zero, then its derivative also goes to zero. Plus infinity. But more crucial <clears throat> are um, two properties. Uh, with the first one uh, we call omega freeness. And this controls which kind of second order linear differential equations have solutions. So as we saw before, you know, this is a, it's a more complicated issue. Um, and omega freeness somehow encodes which ones have solutions. And then there's the other property, which is called Newton, Newtonianity. And this one should think of as a, as a differential version of Henselianity for value field. Okay. Um, and then the h closed fields are those h fields which satisfy these four properties. <clears throat> okay. So now let me say a few words about omega freeness and Newtonianity. But um, I will not give you the precise definitions because it takes you know, a lot of time to digest them. So I'll just give you a picture. <laughs> the last time I tried to explain it in a down to earth uh, way, I actually made some mistakes. So instead, <laughs> instead of, I just opted to not give you the definition, <laughs> just draw a picture. Um, so, so the upshot is that there are um, certain kinds of differential algebraic functions, omega and sigma, which are related to Riccati polynomials. Um, I mean, the omega is in fact uh, an outright Riccati polynomial, order one. Um, and they determine certain kinds of convex subsets of, of a Hardy field. So I don't know, how can I, can I point? Can I point somewhere? I, I, I can point, yes. Um, so you should not take these uh, approximate symbols here too literally. I mean, these, they do make sense in, in certain kinds of Hardy fields. But uh, this is just a way for us to think about these things. So um, the first region here is, is determined by this, by this uh, cut uh, gamma. And this is a, well, in the 19th century, they called this the ideal boundary of convergence. So this determines whether the integral of some f will converge or diverge. And this will depend on whether it lies to the left or the right of, of, this, of this cut um, determined by omega. Um, okay, so that's omega. Now, if you look at the logarithmic derivative of omega, or rather it's negative, um, this, is a, this will determine another cut. Um, gamma, sorry. Um, and this gives you this element lambda, um, which uh, formally has this, this kind of asymptotic expansion here. Uh, so this determines another region. And now to the left of that, we study this function omega, which is a certain Riccati polynomial. And there it has a very nice behavior. Uh, namely, it's, uh, you know, it, as, it, as you can see here, it's uh, strictly increasing. Um, and then, well, the image of this on, on this region, of, of omega on this region, determines yet another convex set. And the cut here is, uh, is determined by little omega. And one can think of this little omega here as, a, as in analogy with gamma as determining the boundary of solv solvability of this kind of second order differential equation uh, as the f varies. Um, and well, there's another, as I said, there's this other function sigma, which comes from above. And well, it, it, uh, it makes sense on, on the whole, all of h except for zero. 
Um, but again, the interesting part is here to the right of gamma. So there the sigma has this nice behavior coming down. Okay, and um, essentially omega three means that this little omega is an element like this, which lies between the image of sigma on, to the right of gamma and omega to the left of lambda. So that's an element here does not exist. Um, yeah, so, so sigma is, is again some Riccati polynomial, but it's, uh, it basically arises by going to the algebraic closure of H and looking at what omega does there and then looking at the real, real imaginary parts. Okay, so that's omega freeness. Um, uh, this is a very amazing property. So one of the uh, things one can show is that it's persistent under differentially algebraic H field extensions, which is really amazing. Okay, and then Newtonianity, well, it's kind of like Henselianity. It says that certain kinds of differential polynomials have zeros in the evaluation. Now, I'm not gonna say which kinds, um, it, just that it can be expressed as a first order axiom scheme, which is important for us. Um, but for the proof of our main theorem, there's an, an equivalence, which is, which is more important. Namely that if you have a Liouville closed H field, it is omega free and Newtonian has these two properties. If and only if, it has no immediate differentially algebraic H field extension. So this is a bit like characterizing Henselianity in terms of algebraic maximality. So now this gives you an idea of how you can establish uh, H closeness, yeah, because you just need to study immediate differentially algebraic H field extensions. Um, but first, how did we arrive at these axioms for H closed fields? Well, they come from another theorem that we approved a couple of years ago, namely um, where we analyzed um, the elementary properties of, uh, of the differential field T of trend series, which I won't introduce here, but they are formal objects which model Hardy field jumps. Um, and then, well, combined with an earlier theorem of yours, this already implied that there were Hardy fields which were H closed and in fact embedded into T. So he had proved an earlier theorem, which together with our theorem from a few years back um, implied this. So then of course it became natural to suspect that maximum Hardy fields were also H closed. Um, but uh, yeah, so before I want to say a few words about the proof, let me uh, say uh, a corollary of, of this, namely that embeddings of Hardy fields into, into the trend series. So this is for the people who know what, trend, what P is. Um, embeddings in, extends to differentially algebraic Hardy field extensions. Yeah, so if you have a Hardy field H that it has an embedding into T and you have a differential algebraic Hardy field extension, then this embedding extends. And so this gives you some sort of ex expansion operator yeah, for, um, for the terms in, in H star, if you have one for H. And one application is here to the path enclosure, right? So the, the Hardy, as an application of this, you get that the Hardy field of the, the path enclosure of the ordered field of reals embeds into T. And then leads to a question, which I just want to briefly state here, namely, can this be generalized, right? So if you have a Hardy field of some O minimal expansion of the reals that already is, has an expansion operator into T, um, take, take the Hardy field of the path enclosure, can you extend this to an embedding into T? Okay. Um, all right, but let me say a few words about the proof. Um, so, omega uh, reaching omega freeness is harder. Is is uh, sorry, reaching omega freeness is is an easier first step, and I won't say anything about that. But this is something that you need to do separately. So let's assume that we're already in the situation that we have a Liouville closed omega free Hardy field. Um, and okay, maybe H is, H is maximal and we want to show that it is H closed. So then according to my equivalence, um, I need to show it's Newtonian. So by contradiction, let's assume it's not Newtonian. Okay, so then by my equivalence, it has to have what we call a hole. Yeah, so there has to be an immediate, proper immediate differentially algebraic H field extension. Um, so a hole is a triple which encodes that. So there's a polynomial, differential polynomial, non-constant. There's some element, a hat, not in H, in some immediate H field extension of H. So it is now an abstract H field, yeah, which uh, satisfies this differential equation. 
And then uh, for good, good measure, I also throw in an asymptotic condition um, with this M here. So I want to require A hat to be strictly dominated by M. Okay, so, so by this key equivalence, if you're Liouville closed in omega free, but not Newtonian, then there has to be such a hole. Okay, and of course we want to show that then we can um, extend our Hardy field to contradict maximality. Okay, so now if you have such a hole, you can choose the P to have to be of minimal complexity. And I'm not going to tell you what the complexity is, but there's a natural notion of complexity for differential polynomials, which involves the order and the degree, etc. Um, okay, and now these these minimal holes, they're sort of like minimal counterexamples, right? In, in combinatorics, you also argue like this, right? take, you argue by contradiction and then you take something to be minimal and uh, it has special properties. And then what we do in a nutshell is we massage this hole <laughs> to bring it into a nice form. So we do various operations on holes, for example, replacing um, the variable y by a plus y, and then, well, correspondingly, you have to replace a hat by a hat, min a hat minus a, where a is some, some, give, some given term. Um, so we show that you can do this operation. I mean, there's a list of certain kinds of operations that you can do. This is one of them. You show that you can transform this hole into one. And it looks like, well, that's very special. Okay, the M here is normalized to be one. Um, but the Q, the, the new polynomial, has a very nice shape that makes it easy to explicitly solve the differential equation. Okay. Um, and there are certain kinds of approximation arguments that are used there. And of course it leverages this minimal, this choice of P to be minimal very much. And what's interesting here is that completions play an important role. And this is very strange in, because in, usually in modern theory of valid fields, you know, maximal immediate extensions are, are more important, but uh, here completions are important. Okay, so now, how does this normalized differential polynomial look like? Well, um, you can write it as a difference L minus R, where L is a, a linear differential. Um, it's a composition of differential polynomials of linear of order one. So it's a linear differential polynomial. And these order one factors, um, well, they, their coefficients don't lie in H, but in, in the algebraic closure, H adjoint I. And in fact, there's another condition here about uh, the real part. So this L factors, as Poole would do it, yeah, um, into order one factors. And the rest, the R here is, is very small in a certain valuation theoretic way compared to, uh, compared to, to the coefficient of L. And then um, this, this first property, this fact that this L decomposes like this, allows us to construct a, a certain right inverse for this differential operator given by L. And then by number two and one, um, you can then use a, the contractive mapping principle to solve the equation um, Q of Y equals zero or rather L of Y equals R of Y um, by, by looking at a certain nonlinear operator that involves the definition of this L inverse. Um, okay, now this is a, of course a very rough uh, picture. Um, so let me explain why it is very much simplified. So the first one is, okay, you need to turn this into analysis. So this means you cannot just work with terms. You need to actually fix representatives. You need to introduce the right function spaces, the right norms to make all these things contractive, et cetera. Um, and then to show that if you have such a solution that you cannot join it um, to get a hardy field also takes um, quite some effort. But more seriously, um, I was cheating big time because in order to get this factorization of, of the linear part or this, this L, um, you need to work not just with minimal holes in H, but with minimal hold, holes in the algebraic closure of H. Um, so of course, then you go outside the H field setting, but we have a category of, of what we call um, um, asymptotic differential fields, which in, includes things like H, H adjoint I. Um, right. Yeah, because inductively, um, in order to, uh, to get this factorization, you need already a detailed subscription of the solutions of, the, of linear differential equations over the algebraic closure. Um, and for that, coming back to the beginning of the talk, um, we need, among 
some analytic results, this idea of factor, factoring differential operators a la boot. Um, okay, so, so give me, let me finish by giving you a few applications to linear differential equations as promised um, that come out of this, uh, this study of the solution spaces. So let me uh, now go back to the real setting. So let me take a differential operator here. We write D, sorry, we write this little D here instead of this big D like we would do. Um, and let's say it's monic, so the leading coefficient is one. And let uh, E be a maximal Hardy field extending H. So then as a consequence of our study, uh, this A will factor over E into a product of order one and order two factors. And over the algebraic closure, it will actually factor into order one factor. But over E, uh, you can have order two factors. And it, now when does it factor into a product of order one operators, which would be much better. Um, well, this is the case if and only if A has no oscillating zeros whatsoever, which makes sense. Um, and in two, in fact, you can find a factorization that is in some sense canonical. So in two, A actually factors into product of order one operators over the intersection of all maximum Hardy fields with extent H. So this is something called E of H. Um, and this was introduced by, by Boja Nitzan, um, called this the perfect hull of, of H. Um, and this E of H is, is still a little bit mysterious to us. Um, so it can be omega free sometimes. Um, so even if, if H is omega free, then E of H will be, but not, not the other way around. Um, and it would be interesting to, to have a, an algebraic characterization of when a Hardy field um, agrees with its, with its perfect color. Uh, but we only have um, um, what do you call this necessary condition. Uh, okay, but let me go back to the complex uh, setting, for the, um, namely uh, to this fundamental theorem about holonomic functions, which I had mentioned at the beginning. So now there's a nice generalization of this for Hardy fields. Namely, okay, now, okay, so for simplicity, let me assume that H is now maximal. And let's say you have an, an n cross n matrix over the algebraic closure. Then you can look at the differential equation y prime equals my in the differential equation. Uh, we know that the solution space has to, has to have dimension n um, over the complexes. And as, an out, as, a, as a byproduct of our, of our methods, we get an explicit description of a fundamental system, which is very analogous to those of, you know, Frobenius and Hooks and so on. Namely that um, you get terms which have um, a vector here in K, so they are not oscillating, multiplied with an exponential, right, where the, where the frequency, so to speak, uh, is from H. Um, and this, so, so you can separate the oscillating and the non-oscillating part, right, and the way that the oscillation occurs in terms of these fees is also given by the elements in H. In fact, you can be more precise. Uh, you can even assume that the fees are sort of separated apart. I mean, they're either zero or they go off to infinity or uh, if you take any two of them, they either agree or they, uh, they go, their difference goes to infinity. Um, okay, and then if the matrix M in fact has suitable symmetries, uh, then you can also guarantee that there is a, a, a non-oscillating solution. For example, if M is skew symmetric and little n is odd, then uh, there will be a solution where one of the fees fee is zero. Um, and uh, well, you can also say, can say much more. I mean, for example, for um, equations where the M is Q is uh, anti skew symmetric, like Schrodinger equation, you get special kinds of uh, fees and so on. Um, okay, and then my second to last slide. Uh, as a corollary, even for, for N equals two, this is uh, sort of interesting. Um, so, so now go back to the second order equation, which I have talked about. So much before. So we have uh, an equation now of y double prime plus a times y prime plus b y equals zero. a and b are in, in a Hardy field. And let's assume it has an oscillating solution. So then, in fact, you can describe the oscillating solutions in an explicit way like this. So there are germs g and phi in some Hardy field extension such that any solution of L has the form some constant times g times cosine of phi plus another constant. So they're parameterized by this, by this g and phi uh, in, this, in this very explicit way. Yeah, and this was uh, mentioned by Boschanitzan in, in one of his papers on, on Hardy fields. 
And um, well, he said he had a proof for this, but uh, this proof was never published. So, um, but um, okay. And I think what's kind of neat here is that even for some very classical um, second order differential equations, like the one for the Bessel function, um, you get some, some information, which I think is new. Um, so the Bessel equation is, is this one. It depends on the parameter alpha, which I assume to be real here. I mean, people also studied this with complex parameter alpha, but I think this is called the order of the equation. It looks, it looks like this. Um, so then as a consequence of this, uh, this corollary, you get that there is a unique term in a phi, in a hard field, uh, which satisfies this asymptotic condition, such that the solutions of the Bessel equation are exactly parameterized like this. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing because there, there's this famous book of Watson. In fact, I, I skimmed through this book, tried to see whether there's anything known like this about uh, um, the Bessel equation, but I don't think um, it is. Uh, okay, um, that's all I wanted to say. And now the story about the picture. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this was uh, in, uh, these two gentlemen <laughs> got the car prize <laughs> um, in uh, 2014. And for some reason there was no ceremony. <laughs> so <laughs> we took the opportunity uh, and uh, used uh, the staircase of the Vienna City Hall as a backdrop for <laughs> staging um, a, our own ceremony. And uh, I hope it's not going to take another eight years to, for you guys to, or wait, uh, yeah, eight years to, uh, to come to Vienna again. So, anyway, thank you.